everybody and welcome to the 1723 podcast with me, your host, Sean Butler. Now, today I am joined by Dr. Rick Berman as we look at the Huguenot influence in the 1723 constitution. So, Rick, welcome. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so we'll jump straight into it. Can you tell me about the influence of the Huguenots and why they were such patriots slash committed to the Hanoverian George I and II? I certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so I guess the next question is, would you like me to? Yes, yes please. That would be great if you could, yes. <laughs> I think in order to understand the uh, influence of the Huguenots at the beginning of the 18th century and in connection with Freemasonry and the 1723 constitutions, it's really quite important to understand what percentage they represented in London at the time. They were around 10% of London's population, a huge proportion. Um, Virtually all of them were first or second generation uh, migrants having fled France. And it's really important to understand um, their psychology, their backstory, if you will, um, the factors that drove them to support um, the Protestant George I and the Protestant Hanoverian line. England was for them uh, a sanctuary from what had been in effect almost 200 years of persecution in France. Um, It began with the Reformation at the beginning of the 16th century when the rise of Protestantism threatened the Catholic uh, Church and the Catholic teachings. Um, Catholicism taught, as it does now, that, that the only route to uh, God and to heaven was through the intermediation of the Catholic Church. Yep. And anything that threatened that, such as Protestantism, was obviously a threat uh, to the institution. And the institution was bound up with the uh, French state, much as it was with the Spanish state and the Portuguese and so on and so forth. Um, and what happened from the 1520s, 1530s onwards was two decades of state-sanctioned persecution. And this amounted from time to time to genocide. We're talking uh, the deaths of tens of thousands of Protestants um, in France. There was a little gap um, towards the end of the 16th century when Henry IV, uh, who had been who had been a Huguenot, who had been a Protestant, was um, uh, was made king, um, but he was assassinated, and um, and the persecution of the Huguenots continued, and it reached really a peak in um, the last quarter of the 17th century, with um, two events that took place. The first was the revocation of, of, of the Edict of Nantes, which Henry IV had uh, uh, passed to offer some small protection to um, his French Protestant um, subjects. But Louis XIV, his grandson, revoked that. And with that, all remaining civil liberties and protections uh, that the Huguenots had uh, disappeared. Uh, they were pressurized very heavily to uh, to become Catholics, to give up their faith, and um, they were penalized uh, quite severely if 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 they chose not to. So, what had been a, a sort of trickle of migrants from France through most of the 17th century began to uh, form a torrent, really. So tens of thousands began to leave. Now, the population of the French Huguenot population in France was only about 750,000 in a total population of 18 million. So it wasn't exactly a sort of huge threat to the no. state anyway. But um, the Huguenots were very aspirational. They were if you like, the, the, the professional middle class. And with their departure, France suffered and uh, England gained and indeed mm. other countries where they, um, where they migrated. So of the 750-odd thousand, some 250,000 left France. Right. Um, and and uh, most of those 
50 to 80,000 actually came eventually to England, the rest, Switzerland, the German states, some to America, uh, Southern Africa, Nordic countries and so on. But the biggest single concentration really was in England. And it was that influence that, that, was, that was so fundamental at the beginning of the 18th century. Mm. So you painted this very vivid picture of, of you know, these Huguenots travelling to, to England to seek sort of refuge, really. Um, who, who were the key figures? How, how, who were the sort of main players within this sort of group that, that would obviously go on to, to sort of have such a, you know, a large role in both the, the constitutions that we know, the 1723 constitutions, but also society in general within mm. England at the time? Well, I think it's important to say that, that um, the majority of the Huguenots that came over... Um, were followers of the um, of a French form of Protestantism, obviously. Um, some uh, adopted um, the Church of England. Sure. Um, now, the reason that, th- that this was important is that public office could only be held by um, members of the established church. So dissenters... Uh, people who weren't fo- uh, weren't followers of um, Anglicanism uh, couldn't couldn't exert uh, interest uh, in you know, Parliament and so on. But the key figures, um, the key figures were really, I suppose, in today's terms, social influences. Right. Okay. Um, and and there was a wonderful expression uh, in a newspaper article at the time. Uh, it was a um, clothing manufacturer tailors uh, basically saying that his business was, was was suffering because the only thing that sold today was in the French fashion, uh-huh. was in the Huguenot fashion. Right, yeah. So the Huguenots were prominent in, in, in the skilled trades, in the professions, goldsmithing, silversmithing, gu- gun making, um, fashion, clothing, millinery, they were also very significant um, in the army. Right, okay. um, the Huguenots, the officer class, um, was made up of around a third of Huguenot soldiers, and they were avid supporters of William and Mary. Mm-hmm. So when William uh, began his conquest of Ireland, or his reconquest of Ireland, putting down the Jacobite threat in 1680 to 1690s, significant proportion of the army was staffed by Huguenots, officers and men, and the commander-in-chief was uh, later made the Earl of Galway, and he was a prominent Huguenot um, as well. There are various others that uh, served. The Huguenots were also very important uh, and prominent in the sciences, and um, the key crossover there is uh, Jean Theophilus, Desaguliers, who who was the prime mover in um, in Freemasonry's remolding uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, from 1717 through to the 1720s, right. and was a prime figure in the uh, authorship of the 1723 constitutions. Now, Desaguliers had come over to England as a baby. I mean. Um, Rumour has it that he was smuggled out in a barrel, wow. um, as, as indeed some little children were at that yeah, stage. Of course, yeah. um, but uh, his family migrated via Guernsey. Uh, there's a record of his father uh, coming to Guernsey in St. Peter Port. Um, and from Guernsey, they travelled to um, England and from the south coast uh, up to London. And his father got a job as a very uh, junior church official um, at uh, a church in Swallow Street, just off Piccadilly. Yeah. And there, Desaguliers was brought up in some real poverty. Mm. Um, the church did not give his father a significant income, and a few years later, his father decided to open up a school for French Protestant children, and he did that um, in Islington. Uh-huh. And that gave Desaguliers a slightly better life and a decent education, and from there, he went to a secondary school up at um, uh, in Solihull, and from there, and from there to Oxford, where he was mm. a servitor scholar, which means that um, his... Uh, academic tuition and board was paid for by the college in return for him um, undertaking 
services, yeah. you know, um, uh, for the more uh, affluent college members. There were two types of scholars at Oxford then. There were gentleman scholars who paid and there were servitor scholars who were generally cleverer uh, but, but who didn't pay. And, and, and to put this into perspective, um, uh, I'm not sure entirely what proportion was, um, you know, comprised the servant at last, but, 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 but certainly you can see where they moved on to afterwards. Right, they were very sig significant people. So Desagulier and the Huguenot community were essentially, as you said, fleeing from persecution in uh, France. Now, France was the single biggest military power in Europe at the time. Its population of 18 million dwarfed that of England, which was around four and a half million, roughly the same size as Ireland. Scotland was around two million. Mm. Um, England did not have a standing army. France did. France had a standing army um, at the beginning of the 18th century of close to a million men. I mean, a vast wow. number. So, you know, this was a really serious threat. And, of course, you'd also had the issue of um, William and Mary coming in, James II being thrown out, and James II's children were pretenders to the English, Irish, and Scottish thrones. So the threat from James Stuart was very real, backed, mm. backed by France. So to support Britain, to support George I, was fundamental to the Huguenots, to support a Protestant monarchy that was tolerant yeah. of other faiths and beliefs, and that was giving sanctuary to the Huguenot community. That that was fundamental. And we see this in the development of Freemasonry, which alters in the early 18th century from a relatively nondescript organization mm. to an organization much more the uh, heart of society and an organization that becomes a bastion of society. Yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, as we sort of move to that period where the constitutions are being written, obviously the, the Huguenots would play a, a hugely um, influential role in that process. Were there actual Huguenot lodges? And if so, how many were there? This is, this is quite interesting, actually. There were Huguenot lodges and Huguenots were disproportionately represented within um, English Freemasonry. Now, <clears throat> I'll just talk about a couple of them because mm. um, uh, time is relatively short. The first Huguenot Lodge was um, Solomon's Temple. Yeah, it was, right. um, at least it was called that. And it was, it was um, held um, in the workshop of a Huguenot gunsmith. And all of the members of the Lodge uh, were Huguenots except for two. Um, one was um, uh, a fellow member of the Horn Tavern Lodge, mm. um, Lord Carmichael, uh, and the other was too, James Anderson, the um, uh, one of the authors of the mm. 1723 Constitutions. The head of the Lodge, if you will, was Desagulier. And um, when you look at the um, members of the Lodge, it's, it, it really is a cross-section of... Huguenot migrants in London at the time. So skilled artisans, scientists, um, if you will, the upper middle class. Sure. Um, now, that lodge didn't last very long, um, or at least its records didn't last long. We don't know whether it continued for two, three, four years, but there's only a single year's worth of records. But one lodge which did endure for some time, which was extremely interesting, it was the lodge that met at um, the Prince Eugene's Head Coffee House, just just um, just off um, uh, Pall Mall. Mm. Now, this was um, uh, a very interesting lodge. Again, if you look at the members of the lodge, um, a number of them worked for the Crown um, in senior and mid ranking roles mm. others have been identified as spies wow. and um, probably the most interesting member of the lodge or at least one who was very closely associated 
with it was a chap called Charles de la Fay, another Huguenot, of course. Uh, like so many, he was brought to uh, England as a child. Now, his father um, worked in um, in the Northern Department, which is uh, the equivalent of uh, what was then both Home Office and Foreign Office. Mm. And... Um, and De La Fay, probably through his father's um, connections, also went to Oxford. He was he was uh, actually um, an undergraduate at All Souls, which is oh. which is almost a contradiction in terms. But they had a very small number of junior scholars who, again, in uh, in return for board and education, would um, say prayers um, over lunch and dinner sure. and so on. But De La Fay was brilliant. Um, he rose to the highest level in the civil service. He became secretary to the Lord's Justices, which is the equivalent of um, of a cabinet secretary, the most senior member um, of the civil service. Yep. He was um, permanent secretary uh, in today's terms to a succession of um, secretaries of state. When at a time when the Secretary of State used his senior appointments as a form of patronage. So mm. for someone to stay in there through successive secretaries of state of successive parties, both Whigs and Tories, meant that he really was very well regarded indeed. So not mm. only was he the most senior civil servant um, and, and, and worked with both Tories and Whigs, but he was also tasked with being the the um, <coughs> head of the secret service oh, right. uh, in effect <laughs> he was the he was the chief anti-jacobite spy master wow he was also uh, a leading magistrate in london and became the go-to figure when uh, when the administration was looking to prosecute uh, you know, suspected jacobites yes. treason and so on and the lodge prince eugene's lo- uh, head uh, coffee house the lodge at one point was actually used as a meeting place for um uh diplomatic endeavors when when the um uh holy roman emperor was sending over um uh, a senior diplomat to discuss how britain might support um austria and hungary against its external threats the lodge became a suitable um, venue for 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 um, this very sensitive and very private conversation. Wow. It does not appear in any of the national archives, but quite interesting, it did appear in a press article <laughs> that noted the <laughs> attendance of these very senior men right. uh, at this particular lodge. Wow, amazing! Well, Rick. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I would say to our listeners, take note of some of the names that we've heard there because they are absolutely key to the story that we'll be telling you uh, about the 1723 constitutions in episodes that are going to follow. Now, just as a reminder, please do hit subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes of the 1723 podcast. Make sure you're following United Grand Lodge of England on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the usual platforms. It's been an absolute pleasure being with you today and we will see you soon. (music) Thank <music> you.